You're listening to the Diplomats podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, this is Ankit Panda, your host, recording in Washington, D.C. And I am your co-host, Katie Putz, also recording in Washington, D.C. Well, Katie, it happened again. Uh, the United States has elected Donald Trump, the president, once again. Uh, Trump becomes the second president in American history to win a non-consecutive term since Grover Cleveland. Uh, he has uh, this time amassed a more resounding mandate uh, with 312 electoral college votes, uh, defeating the Democratic Party's candidate Kamala Harris uh, for the presidency. Now, it's still early days. Uh, we're having this conversation. Uh, we're taping just less than a week since the election actually took place. So there's still a lot of ambiguities about personnel. But I think compared to 2016, when Donald Trump's victory was a general shell shock, and I think he represented something of an unprecedented kind of leadership in American foreign policy in particular, uh, that observation no longer applies today. Uh, Trump is a known quantity. His disposition is well understood. Um, but I think there's a lot we can dig into today about the general expectations in Asia, some of the early reactions from leaders. And why don't we actually start there? Um, how has initially, at least, uh, the Asian world, so to speak, uh, reacted to Trump's victory, at least publicly? Well, so, you know, as as happens every time there's an election, uh, or at least most times there's an election, uh, countries send congratulatory notes. Uh, and so I I, uh, I obviously paid it more attention to the Central Asian responses because that's sort of my bailiwick. Uh, but my colleague Shannon took a look at the East Asian uh, allies of the United States and sort of their responses. Um, and, and these things always kind of follow sort of a formula, a formula, a certain format. They say, congratulations, we look forward to working forward to you. Um, when we look at the East Asian allies, so South Korea's President Yoon um, responded in a, a tweet, you know, under your strong leadership, the future of the ROK-US alliance in America will shine brighter. Uh, Japan's Prime Minister, uh, Ishiba Shigeru, who may or may not be uh, sort of ruling alongside Trump. We'll see how the, the Japanese sort of uh, their own political situation settles out. But he also sort of, Harken to the alliance, you know, truly look forward to working closely with you to further bolster the U.S.-Japan alliance. And so these two East Asian allies certainly leaned into that alliance structure and sort of called back to the stability in this relationship that has outlet that has lasted through numerous presidencies, numerous kinds of presidencies. Um, we also saw a similar sort of hearkening to shared values and interests from uh, Taiwan's president in his congratulatory note. And so certainly these, however, were, were pretty brief. Um, I'm not certain if they had longer letters, but when I looked at the Central Asian responses, um, it the one that struck me the most was Uzbekistan's president sent a pretty long letter, really, and had not done this um, when Joe Biden was elected. Uh, had, had only sent a congratulatory note on the inauguration. But this letter really, to me, highlighted the understanding, I think, that Donald Trump likes to be... Uh, flattered. Uh, and that is an effective foreign policy tool. Flattery is an effective foreign policy tool, certainly um, for Donald Trump. And so the letter was very laudatory, you know, uh, it mentioned a convincing victory, um, sort of, I don't think it used the word mandate, but effectively said, you know, this overwhelming mandate. Um, and then and then really like laid out what what Mirza is interested in working with Donald Trump on. And so it was actually quite detailed for one of these letters. Um, and the the last thing I'll sort of say on this is that we can't read too deeply into these things. They do come out, but I think it is interesting to sort of gauge, um, you know, where countries are. So the East Asian allies are really trying to lean into this existing relationship and the Central Asian countries, which have a relationship with the United States, but not an alliance in any kind of the word, um, sort of pushing into this, you know, what what can we do? There's a, there's a sense of that transactional nature to these these some of these letters, um, and there's there's numerous other ones. I haven't, for example, read the the Chinese one, but I assume it's out there. Yeah, I think I think that's interesting. You know, I, I would say it, um, on that note of reactions from leaders uh, in 2016, of course, there was a uh, unprecedented phone call between uh, Donald Trump and the Taiwanese leader, uh, and mm -hmm. this time. Um, we haven't yet seen that, uh, but very much a possibility during the transition. Um, the consequences of that, I think, would be rather different, uh, you know, eight, eight, eight years onwards, especially given the cross-strait dynamics that we have seen. I mean, just on just on that note, you know, I think um, 
this time around, uh, even if there is a greater understanding of some of these dynamics that might benefit countries in their dealings with the United States, so the personal flattery that you pointed out, for instance, um, I think there's also going to be deeper anxiety about um, the way in which the administration s- staffs up under the transition, right? Because mm-hmm. this is not a new observation at this point, but the second Trump administration, the expectation across the board is that compared to the first term uh, when Trump did pull from a fairly, in many cases, fairly traditional set of uh, former Republican policymakers or even senior officials from the business world, for instance, you know, Rex Tillerson, who came in as Trump's first secretary of state. This time, the Mm -hmm. kinds of figures that are going to come in are going to be far more aligned with Trump philosophically on a lot of issues. Uh, And I think that is going to result in a substantially different approach to, to U.S. policy, right? And I think that's where allies in particular of the United States are quite a bit concerned because a lot of things that Trump has said publicly on the campaign trail um, fit in very nicely to an alliance skeptic uh, view of the United States dealings with the world. Uh, the alliances survived the first Trump term from NATO to the South Korea and Japan alliances in particular. Uh, this time, I think um, things might look a little bit different, uh, especially given mm-hmm. the worse security environment, the greater demands on assurance from the United States. Uh, and so that, I think, is something to keep an eye out from. Uh, the phrase that, you know, I was actually, uh, I just got back from a trip to Asia. I was in uh, Australia right before the election, and I actually was on an eight-hour flight without any internet to Singapore. Uh, and so I saw all of the results after I landed. But uh, in Singapore, it was interesting. I had a bit of a opportunity to engage with uh, some folks from around the region, not just from Southeast Asia. And I think the phrase that I kept coming back to was sort of borrowing from, I guess, the psychoanalysis literature, where essentially I said, <laughs> you know, if you had a bit of a uh, super ego in in the first Trump administration, kind of those figures who would give something of a veneer of normalcy to Trump's very idiosyncratic approach, of course, expect far less of that, right? You're going to have kind of the pure id, so to speak, of Donald Trump, like really, I think the expression in American foreign policy uh, of the president's inclinations. I think this is maybe a good pivot point to talk a bit about. Um, I think, I think you know, today we'll talk a bit about maybe the broader diplomatic approach, the consequences for the economies of many of these countries in Northeast Asia, uh, alliances more broadly. uh, And then as the transition plays out, I think we'll be back on this podcast to talk a bit more in detail about regional security dynamics. So uh, where do you want to start first, Katie? Yeah, I mean, I I think the the obvious place to start is the the place we have the greatest wealth of information so far, which is Donald Trump's sort of trade approach. He is sort of talked almost nonstop about tariffs. And so from what I've read, it seems likely uh, the Trump administration will push some kind of tariff structure, which inadvertently, or actually not even inadvertently, will directly affect a sort of East Asian allies of the United States in particular. Um, you know, obviously the the target, and I think the target in the language is China, uh, but, but any kind of tariff structure is really going to affect countries like Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, sort of some of these places where um, you know, business has sort of dispersed into exporting from those countries, um, but that has the effect of sort of driving up those trade imbalances that really irritate uh, the president-elect. And so I I think watching how those relationships are managed both on the diplomatic side and then the trade side and how those two interact, um, because it it is, it's, you know, these are our American allies, but they're also competitors in some areas. And so which sort of leaning um, of the, the that scale goes can can really affect the the broader relationship. Um, how do you how do you sort of interpret a lot of this talk about tariffs and, and that that uh, the trade dynamics? Yeah, so, you know, I think this is the one area where I think there's the greatest clarity on personnel because Trump has already invited Robert Lighthizer, uh, his former mm-hmm. U.S. trade representative, um, Uh, and an enthusiast for tariffs more broadly to join the second Trump administration. And so I think uh, it's it's fairly credible that they will try to implement trade policies that head in this direction. I think here we have to talk a bit about um, American domestic politics and the broader coalition that is sort of swept into um, government, right? So we are expecting a Republican-controlled Senate, uh, very likely Republican-controlled House, uh, but... um, there's also this new dynamic where um, several kind of Silicon Valley tech leaders, uh, Elon Musk, for instance, are part of this new coalition and may even be involved in the Trump administration in some formal or informal advisory capacity. And so when it comes to tariffs, I think um, you are going to see, I think, divergent perspectives within the Republican Party, right? Because all of the analysis, of course, suggests that if Trump were to proceed and implement these tariffs, 
the costs on the U.S. economy in various sectors uh, would largely be pretty negative, uh, at least um, at least initially, uh, it, in a really big way. And so the question is, you know, will you see some kind of some kind of more moderate approach than some of the scenarios that have been laid out uh, in the rhetoric, such as, you know, 60% tariffs on certain categories of products from China, uh, which would obviously be uh, unprecedented in their intensity. And so the domestic political process of how that gets hammered out, I think, is going to be worth keeping an eye on. Um, yeah. The um, And look, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that and everything does get implemented. And I think that's going to have an interesting effect on American politics by the midterm elections, potentially, right? And so the... Um, the the broader direction there, I think, is very much, um, very much, I think, contingent at the moment. I mean, I think it's pretty it, 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 it's pretty fair to say, though. I think um, you know there are some other interesting scenarios here that are worth talking about. Um, this is sort of a security issue, but obviously, you know, Trump has spoken a lot about the war in Ukraine, right, uh, and mm -hmm. and the Russia Ukraine conflict, and it's quite possible that the U.S. might significantly change its approach uh, if there is some movement towards a steady state or a settlement uh, and if part of that involves the united states being involved in loosening uh, economic sanctions on russia which of course will have ripple effects across the indo-pacific region uh, and asia more broadly but again uh, we have no actual clarity on what the plan there will be i think uh, trump's first phone call with putin uh, did not really get into that. There was mostly just a warning to not escalate the conflict in Ukraine from Trump to Putin, which uh, was sort of interesting, given that Trump and Putin, of course, have a natural affinity on some of these things. Uh, but that, I think, kind of factors into the economic conversation here in Asia in a big way. Yeah, well, and, and, and something I wanted to mention about that call, you know, while we, we only sort of have what people said was said, um, the, the Kremlin has denied the call happened at all. So I think that's an interesting sort of signaling device. One of the things Donald Trump has said is on his first day of office, he'll sort of settle the Ukraine thing, never offers any kind of plan on how that would happen. Um, but th this does not bode well for that. If the Kremlin is sort of responding to Donald Trump's call with with their president as saying it didn't happen, um, it, that 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 is not the like bon homey i think people were maybe hoping that that relationship could do but again we'll have to wait and see how that uh sort of spins out because we've seen uh, certainly in the interactions donald trump has had with leaders like kim jong-un for example so sort of there is a back and forth and it can be a very on and off relationship so i will we'll see how that kind of pans out but certainly the ukraine aid is something that i think a lot of people are concerned will will get cut um i think there are similar questions in taiwan about how how far u.s commitments will go to taiwan um and yeah so you know i think this is something we're going to say a lot until things happen is we don't really know until they happen we can do do our best to sort of think through it yeah i mean i think on the taiwan piece um it's interesting because you know trump has repeatedly implied the exact opposite of what Joe Biden implied, which was that, you know, the U.S. would defend Taiwan, uh, kind of resolving some of the ambiguity uh, Biden has done this you know, on multiple occasions. Uh, Trump's done the opposite. I think he's uh, he said on the campaign trail, you know, Taiwan is 100 miles from China. It's thousands of miles from the United States. What can we really do if they decided to invade? Um, that's, of course, very dangerous because it, it might create the conditions for a deliberate uh, attack or invasion. Um, and, and look, I mean, the U.S. could overreact, right? I think Here's where the China, the U.S. China security piece of this gets interesting because Trump has sort of said these things. He sort of implied that he has this sort of, you know, Bismarckian vision of Asian security where he might even cut a deal with China over the fate of Taiwan. Um, uh, and, you know, I think uh, that's the most disconcerting for allies and smaller countries in the region, which is the U.S. might actually start behaving a lot more like China and Russia in its approach to thinking about spheres of influences around the world. And, and, and that's, of course, a, a very dangerous world then. Um, Asian countries have gotten used to. Um, but for Taiwan in particular, Trump dislikes looking weak, right? So even if the implication is that the U.S. would not get involved, the possibility is some kind of American overreaction, which of course raises the specter of um, misperception, miscalculation between the U.S. and China, even if the expectation is that Trump would not actually defend Taiwan. And here, of course, there is the question of, you know, who's going to staff up the administration? Because there's actually a big debate within the Republican Party on this particular question, what U.S. policy towards China and Taiwan should be, uh, what are the objectives of that policy? Um, you have sort of the more ideological parts of the party that are more broadly concerned about the nature of the Chinese regime, the Communist Party of China, 
uh, talking in ways that imply an interest in regime change. Uh, you saw this, for instance, most prominently in the first Trump term, I think, with Mike Pompeo, who was CIA director and secretary of state. Pompeo is not going back into the new administration now. So that's, mm-hmm. I think, uh, one signal, uh, potentially. Uh, and then you do have sort of other thinkers within the party that are far more interested in promoting support for Taiwan. Uh, and so very much uh, up in the air right now how this will play out. But the broader disposition of the president, I think, is pretty well known. Um, But of course, you know, as as I said, even if it is well known, that's no guarantee that we end up somewhere um, stable where the U.S. and China could actually have some kind of an accommodation or understanding on Taiwan. Yeah, yeah, I I think we're going to have to see how those relationships um, go. And, And again, I would urge people to think back to that the relationship with Kim Jong-un and, and, and that the sort of back and forth of that. Um, so all, all things are possible, it seems. So I, I think I think we should dive into that, the North Korea angle, you know, especially because I have you, Ankit. Um, you know, where do you see that relationship going, given that the history of that relationship is very hot and cold, fire and fury, and then best friends, and then silence again. So, you know, is it on? Is it off? How do you think it's going to go? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough one, honestly. I mean, you know, I think I think with Trump, I mean, you're kind of rolling the dice, right? Uh, as you said, it's it's very easy to imagine confrontation being the first instinct, uh, and particularly, I think this is the case if Japan and South Korea are able to flatter Trump and somehow get Trump to take the issue of North Korean uh, testing seriously. This was something that President Yoon of South Korea and Trump discussed on their initial call, and Trump apparently expressed some concern about North Korean missile launches. Um, I think the broader changes in the geopolitical context, though, since the 2019 Hanoi summit, which failed, um, and, you know, the North Koreans are on a completely different trajectory today, uh, deepening ties with Russia in particular. Uh, I think here again, there's a question about Ukraine, because I think Ukraine is a big forcing function right now in the Russia-North Korea relationship. Uh, And so if there, again, is some change to the trajectory of that conflict, uh, and Russia no longer needs North Korean munitions and personnel quite in the way that it does right now, uh, that of course, it doesn't end the Russia-North Korea relationship overnight, but I think it transforms the nature of that partnership, and I think it actually gives the North Koreans potentially more of a reason than they do, absent change in that dynamic, uh, to seek engagement with the United States. But again, look, I mean, the broader disposition in North Korea has been to turn away from the U.S. They have not indicated post-election that anything has changed with Trump's election. Um, so very much to be seen what happens here, um, to be seen also, I think, you know, depending on what the alliances do, all right, or or is there going to be an overreaction in the case of a North Korean seventh nuclear test, which I think is quite likely it could even happen before the transition concludes itself. Um, that will have the effect of, I think, putting North Korea, uh, much higher on the U S security agenda, right. In, in 2017, with the new Trump administration in Washington, North Korea, was in many ways the top issue on the agenda. Uh, This was something that President Obama had even indicated to Trump during the transition, saying that you're going to have to spend a lot of time on North Korea because things are about to get pretty bad. Um, Very different world today with Ukraine, wars in the Middle East, uh, so on and so forth. But um, the North Koreans um, may well end up back at the top of the agenda, if not higher on the agenda in in U.S. policy. Yeah, and and just a a last thought sort of on that security angle. And and again, we will come back to this on this podcast, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, we'll have to keep an eye on some of the mini lateral formats that the Biden administration has tried to at least institutionalize. So the, the U.S., Japan, South Korea, trilateral is one, uh, AUKUS, see where that goes, the quad. There's a lot of sort of moving parts and, and sort of forums, which, you know, dip, again, depending on who comes in with the administration and their sort of level of knowledge and familiarity and valuing of some of these things is really going to affect, I think, how how the the trajectory of those go. Um, and that will obviously have implications for the wider sort of security structure in, in Asia. Yeah, no, AUKUS is a, is a good one. I mean, you know, having just returned from Australia, uh, I can say there was, uh, I was there before the election, but, you know, the anxiety about what happens with AUKUS if Trump wins, I think was very much palpable, right? Uh, and the instinct there, I think, is to look at other allies like South Korea, where cost sharing talks, you know, in the past, uh, Trump mm-hmm. essentially uh, apply to five times multiple to what the U.S. had traditionally asked from South Korea, right? Taking host nation support payments from about one billion to five billion. That was the ask of the Trump administration. So, you might imagine with the Aussies um, lining up to buy U.S. Virginia class submarines, uh, the price tags might increase substantially. And this is at a time mm-hmm. when the domestic debate on AUKUS in Australia is already getting substantially more sensitive to uh, the long term costs associated with that project. So, the Aussies will have, I think an interesting bid to sort of stabilize that relationship. 
Uh, and you also have a, a labor government now in Australia, right? This was, um, uh, you know, Trump had a very difficult relationship in the past with um, uh, conservative Australian leaders, uh, for instance, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, who famously had a terrible relationship with with Trump. So personal relationships matter. I think that's one of the big takeaways from our discussion so far. So it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but yeah, Katie, I think there's a lot more to talk about here, but, uh, you know, uh, I think we can do our listeners the service of coming back when honestly, we have a better idea of the administration's policy. So consider this a first cut. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about South Asia, for instance, where I think there's quite a bit of, um, India, I think is one of the countries that's actually quite positively disposed towards the second Trump administration, uh, in a big Mm -hmm. way, but we'll come back and talk a bit about that. But uh, in the meantime, um, yeah, things are about to get, uh, pretty wild. Uh, and so, uh, we will be, uh, covering all of that uh, at the Asia Geopolitics podcast. Yes, indeed. We will be here to uh, help everyone try to understand what's going on. Uh, But in the interest of time, we'll end this here. Uh, Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Make sure you like and follow us, recommend the podcast to your friends. And as always, feel free to get in touch with Ankit or myself with ideas for future episodes. Uh, We love to hear from you. Uh, Take care. Thanks, Katie. Until next time.